Hello everybody, welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Now, before we get started, make sure you're smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. Every like and subscription really helps build the channel. You know what else helps? Spread the word to your friends about the best wine show anywhere. So at the end of last year, I reviewed six different Cabernet Sauvignons from Chile. To start off this year, I'm gonna review eight different Sauvignon Blancs from Chile. These are all free samples provided to me and I have no restrictions on how I review them. All right, so if you want to get a more detailed explanation of Chilean wine, then check out my first episode of the Cab series, episode 99, about the Miguel Torres Correa de las Cabernet Sauvignon. The link will be below. With that said, let's get some other facts out of the way. I got these from a webinar about the wines. First, Sauvignon Blanc is the second most exported grape to the US after Cabernet Sauvignon from Chile. Carbonara wasn't even listed in the top eight. That sucks, it's one of my favorites. Anyway, it's also the third most consumed Sauvignon Blanc in the market after ones from New Zealand, followed by ones from the US in the US. I was very surprised about these stats. I figured Sancerre would be up there, but I guess not. It wasn't until the 1980s that Sauvignon Blanc started becoming a thing with Pablo Morande leading the charge. I'll be doing one of his wines later in this series. The coastal regions of Coquimbo, Valparaiso, and O'Higgins being the first places it was planted. Pablo started planting in the Casablanca region. Now, his reasoning was seeing the success of the grape in the Carneros region in California. Now, Carneros straddles both Napa and Sonoma and faces Saint pa San Pablo Bay, which then becomes San Francisco Bay. So you have a very similar environment with cool climate and early morning fog. Now, if you remember from my cab series, there are three climatic zones or regions that Chile is divided into. From east to west, they are the Andes, the Entre Cordilleras, and then the coastal range. Even though Chile does have a basic north to south range of climates, with the north being hot and dry, being a hot dry desert, and the south getting cooler overall, and technically a desert or close to it based on annual rainfall as you get closer to the coast. It's really the east to west climatic conditions that matter. You may also remember that the Humboldt current is a big factor. It's a cold current that comes up from Antarctica and travels the entire length of Chile and into Peru before turning west into the Pacific Ocean. Because the water is so cold, it hinders precipitation. It does encourage fog, however. And this is where the influence of seeing Sauvignon Blanc comes in with the similar cool climate and fog of Carneros. All the wines from the series come from the coastal regions. They should all have a few characteristics that are similar. Pronounced herbal character like jalapeno, asparagus, grass, citrus aromas like lime and lemon, and high acidity. Now, due to the proximity to the ocean, that will moderate the climate. And the morning fog also helps moderate the climate. And then we have granitic soils uh, that will enhance all these characteristics. For this series, I'll be doing the wines in order of price from least expensive to most expensive uh, suggested retail price. These range from about $15 to $25. All the wineries seem to be well respected from the research I did, so I expect excellent quality across the board. Okay, let's dive into a little background of the first wine. We have the Vigna Montes. These guys make a wide range of wine styles and also price points from value, so sub $10, to Icon, which is $200 and above. One of my favorites from them is Purple Angel, a Carbonair blend always with a high percentage of Carbonair. The label really never puts just Carbonair, but it's almost always enough to be labeled just that. It's typically under 100, but recently had a pretty big price increase. It's around 130 or so. Anyway, if anyone is watching, anyone from the winery is watching, feel free to send a sample of that to me sometime call me. Anyway, so there really isn't a whole lot of history on their website. I mean, it looks like a lot, but most of it's marketing fluff and not the kind of information I'm looking for. Okay, make it sound worse than it is, but it left me wanting to know more. Let's start with the founding of it in 1987 as the company Discover Wine Limited. Two men, Aurelio Montes and Douglas Murray, were the original founders. Their goal was to produce the highest quality wines in Chile. 
Two others joined him in 1988, Alfredo Vidaure and Pedro Grand, or Grand, I guess. Uh, well, probably Grand. At this point, the company became Vigna Montes. Now let's pause right here. I really would have liked to know more about these four guys and what was their background. All we get is that they are visionaries. Uh, while it doesn't matter if any or all had prior experience in winemaking or even being in the industry since thousands of successful wineries have been founded by people who were never in the industry before, it's nice to get a more detailed origin story. Well, if you dig a little deeper on the website by going to the blog page, we can find out a little bit more. It turns out that Aurelio began his winemaking career with Viña uh, Undaraga, one of the oldest wineries in Chile. After graduating from the Catholic University of Chile, uh, I'm guessing with a winemaking degree, he was there for 12 years, the, the winery, and then went to Viña San Pedro uh, as its production manager. I don't have any timeline for this. However, it's during his time at Vina San Pedro that he meets his future business partners, Douglas Murray in marketing, Alfredo Viadore uh, for finance, and Pedro Grand, Pedro Grand for wine technology. Moving on, their first wine was the Montes Alpha Cabernet Sauvignon. I haven't had it too often, but I can say it's always been great when I have had it sent me one of those too. It was the wine that put them on the map and was the first premium wine exported from Chile. Paraphrasing their website, it helped spawn a new era for Chilean wine. More styles soon came after in the Alpha line. Then they concentrated on their next level up with their Montes Alpha M and Folly and the aforementioned Purple Angel. Along the way, other wines in different price points were created and now they have about eight lines of wine totaling more than 30 throughout those lines. The winery is ran by six families now, Montes, Garces Silva, Barros, Murray, Garachi, and uh, Vidaure. Uh, I'll be reviewing a wine from Garces Silva later on in the series, so look out for that. This wine comes from the Leda Valley, which is in the San Antonio Valley, which is part of the larger Aconcagua DO. The vineyard sits on the western part of the Cordillera de la Costa Range, which is the coastal range, uh, is a short eight miles or 13 kilometers or so east from the coast. So it's very much influenced by the Pacific Ocean. I'm pretty sure they own the vineyard, but it's a bit unclear. Like many Chilean wineries, they either own vineyards or source from vineyards throughout the country. The actual winery is about 65 miles or over 100 kilometers from the vineyard. Let's get into the stats for the wine. The 2021 Vigna Montes Limited Selection Sauvignon Blanc suggested retail price is $15 from the Valle de Leda Dio, or the Leda Valley, in the coastal range, 100% Sauvignon Blanc, clones 1 and 242. Now, we don't really talk about clones much other than Pinot Noir, but all grapes have clonal types, and these are the two main clones that everybody uses. Uh, the vineyard yield is 3.6 tons per acre, or 9 tons per hectare. The harvest dates were March 22nd through April 9th. It's cold fermentation. Now that helps preserve delicate flavors. Basically all the wines in this series are using cold fermentation. Uh, bentonite fining, cold stabilized. Now that helps, present, helps prevent crystallization of tartaric acid, AKA wine diamonds. Again, almost all, really almost all white wines go through this. It's just that they specifically mentioned it in their text sheet. Sterile filtration, now that's very common in wines, helps keep all the nasties out of the final product. Though sterile filtration is like the most aggressive filtration uh, that you can do, but it's still fine. ABV is 13.5%, the pH is 3.25, the total acidity, or the TA more correctly, I'll get to that in a second, 3.99 grams per liter. The VA or volatile acidity is 0.33 grams per liter. The RS is 1.45 grams per liter, so definitely dry. And the free SO2 is 25 grams per liter. All right, a few notes about these stats. Yield, 3.6 tons per acre or nine tons per hectare. That's not really a common stat on a tech sheet, but this is a fairly typical number for a place like well, Napa Valley or really any other high quality wine growing area. Overall, I've seen yields going down as low as two tons per acre or even less, and as high as 10 or so, that this is around the world. Now, somewhere between three to five tons per acre is what you want for high quality grapes. Now, there's a big asterisk with that. It also depends on vine density and other things, but in general, three to five is good target range. The text sheet lists acidity as 
total acidity. Now that number of 3.99 grams per liter seems a bit low based on my experience with Sauvignon Blanc and the pH. Now while pH and acidity are not always in lockstep with each other, they do tend to correlate to where you have low pH equals high acid. With that said, remember that pH is the intensity of an acid, not the amount of acidity. From what I know about all of this, this number is almost certainly the number of 3.99 tri tritatable acidity, not total. Volatile acidity. Now that's really not a common stat uh, as far as a stat sheet. It's basically how vinegary a wine is. Not that it tastes like vinegar, but it's an indication of how much acetobacter is in the wine. And that's what creates vinegar. At the most basic level, the sum of tritatable and volatile acidity should equal total acidity. However, it's more correct to say it's the sum of, quote, both the disso dissociated and undissociated forms of each individual acid, end quote. This is coming from uh, the Australian Wine Research Institute. They have a, uh, they have a uh, page or an article about acidity and pH. Link to it below. Essentially, there are several acids in wine and total acidity should be the sum of all of those. Now, different parts of the world will use total while others tend to use tritatable, but call it total when making a tech sheet for the U.S. market. I don't know. It can be a little confusing because really the U.S., we call it total and there's different ways of measuring this stuff. And their tech sheet has a way they measured it and the way I think it is, it's tritatable, not total, but I could be wrong. RS, I really want to see more wineries put this out. Granted, there are wines out there that are 10 to 20 grams per liter, and it's still not at the level of a Coke. But those will, but these wines will truly taste sweet at that level. All the wines from this set have this value. In other words, they, they put the RS on their, on their uh, sheet. I've found that it's cropping up more and more often with the samples I get. I use this fact as another example that wine is a low sugar beverage by default. FYI, a product is considered zero sugar if it has 0 0.5 grams or less of sugar per serving, not for the whole bottle. In this case, that means the wine, this wine has about 0.22 grams of sugar in a standard serving of wine, which is five ounces. I'm not saying they need to start getting on the low sugar or zero sugar train, I'm just pointing things out to you. Free SO2, I love that this is on here. At least a couple other wines from the set also have that number. There's free and bound SO2, and the sum of these is total SO2. While total SO2 is important, and most countries have maximums, free SO2 is more important than bound because bound is considered an active. Yes and no, right? With that said, there's valuable information in knowing both, but really only to a winemaker. As far as I know, once SO2 is bound, it's no longer reactive as a sulfite by the body. The bound SO2 in three different forms may be broken down to other compounds, but it's not as a sulfite. It's difficult to get a definitive answer, or maybe I'm not searching properly. Um, it's just that once we get into the body and your, you know, your stomach, your digestive system starts playing around with things, things, you know, things change, you know, com the compounds go into different things and they, they combine and recombine to all kinds of stuff. So it's, there's really, as far as I know, no research about that part. All right. Anyway, it's just more ammo to bust the sulfite myth for me. Okay. So enough, enough with the technical stuff. Ooh, that kind of rhymes. Uh, let's get into the wine. All righty. So kind of old school ish for me. Um, I pulled out all the wines from the fridge a while ago. So while they're not like really at room temperature, they're, they're, they're at a much warmer temperature, which old school back when it was Leet Wine TV, uh, I always reviewed all wines, regardless of what kind, well, except for sparkling, uh, at room temperature. So these are still cool to the touch. Uh, by the time I get to the last one, it's probably going to be really close to room temperature. But this one is... And it's actually kind of cool in the house right now, being winter time, and it's like 40 something degrees out. Oh, it's actually 50 degrees out. Uh, and I don't have the heat on really high. Also, this room, there is no, there, there's no air circulation in this part of the house. There's no vents. Uh, it's behind behind the screen and it's kind of far behind the screen. All right. Now this is the first wine of the day for me. So I'm gonna take a big little swig here. Well, first of all, let's just smell it and look at it and I didn't get my papers. 
Well, they're all going to have about the same color. They're all going to be kind of this like straw color because it's all white wines. Well, definitely very aromatic. So Sauvignon Blanc can have this one characteristic um, and it doesn't happen in all Sauvignon Blancs. It doesn't happen all over the world. But there is this characteristic that we, we, we call cat pee. Um, I'm sure there's an, I'm sure there's a chemical compound that it's, that it's known as. It kind of has that a little bit, but that blew off really quickly. Now I'm getting that herbaceousness, that green, that jalapeno, bell pepper, really more bell pepper than jalapeno for me. I know they talked about having asparagus and stuff like that. I can see where they're going with that. I've never really thought of asparagus as a, um, an aroma or as a tasty note for Sauvignon Blanc. But yeah, I get that kind of asparagus and bell pepper com combination going on. Uh, a touch of floral, but not really a lot of floral here. And knowing the fact that this was, there was no oak with this, um, yeah, you, you don't have to detect any oak. All right, now, this, being that it's the first wine of the day for me, uh, I'm going to take a kind of a big swig here, swish everything out, just kind of, you know, cleanse, it, cleanse the palate here. All right. Wow, just from that. Woo! This wine is very flavorful. So let's do a, a proper, you know, taste here. So this would be, um, like, if you were, if someone just handed you this glass of wine and didn't tell you what it was, you would nail it Sauvignon Blanc. Like, there's no, there's no way this could be anything else other than Sauvignon Blanc. Now the trick would be, where is it from? And I'm not going to try to go through the breakdown why it's Chile versus others, because this is going to be really my first foray into what makes Chile and Sauvignon Blanc, you know, Chile and Sauvignon Blanc. But that bell pepper and kind of a jalapeno thing really is the driving force on this. Now, with that said, I do get some citrus on this. Now, I didn't really get the citrus on the nose, um, but I get a little, get more of a grapefruit thing, which is very common with Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, I get a little lemon lime, a little bit orange too. So it's all just citrus driven. It's not like I get like mango or cantaloupe or any like stuff. Very citrus driven and, and that bell pepper more than anything else. And that bit of like jalapeno. I call it Hawaiian pizza type of thing. Because you get, uh, I said pineapple, right? Yeah. You get that kind of, there's like this pineapple-y, jalapeno-like, bell pepper-like combination thing here, right? And I particularly enjoy that. I haven't had a Hawaiian pizza in a long time. Probably should go find one somewhere. Anyway, and it's crisp. Um, yeah, 3.99 grams per liter is total acidity. Nah, dude. This is this is definitely in that six range, at least five. When you added those two numbers, it was like four plus another like point whatever. That got you the less than five. This this is definitely in that five plus range. Granted, pH thing three point two five, so it's still intense, but it is delicious. And it's what fifteen bucks. Yeah, because of that bell pepper jalapeno shit stuff this would be great with say like like some type of uh mexican style chicken right if you get like a like a um some pico de, de gallo or something like that on it or just like some type of salsa like fresh salsa not like you know not like not like you know uh the stuff you know a salsa that's like chunky right and you got you got the, the tomatoes you got the onions you got a little jalapeno in there um you got that and you just put it on top of a, just a simply grilled chicken. Maybe you have like a, maybe you have like a cilantro sauce on it, like a creamy cilantro sauce on there. Uh, that would be great with it. And a Spanish rice and all that, that, or like just enchiladas, Whew. like cheese enchiladas or chicken enchiladas. <sighs> son, this would be, you'd be done, son. Anyway, uh, this is a super delicious wine, especially for like 15 bucks. I, I'm, I'm digging it. I cannot wait to drink this at some point. All right, so that's going to do it for today's show. If you enjoy what I'm doing here, make sure you hit the like button and subscribe and then tell all your friends. And we'll see you next time.